Hello and welcome. In this episode, we are going to talk about what's going on along the front lines in Ukraine. We are talking about the Russian attempts to build further troop strength and about the political implications in both countries, especially the troubles within Russia. Other than that, there is some interesting things going on in Kherson right now. Right now. We are going to talk about that as well. Putin has declared that Russia is rejoining the agreement to export Ukrainian grains because international guarantees were given to him. That's kind of interesting because at the same time, at the beginning of the war, he proclaimed that international guarantees are kind of pointless and untrustworthy and useless for Russia and to justify the war in itself. But this time it's obviously enough. This will obviously be seen as a sign of weakness within Russia within the pro-war sphere, which will likely cause him trouble down the road. From Ukraine, we have information that is that in uh, translated, uh, in, in converted money, roughly $7 million to, that were donated to buy protective vests were embezzled. The Ukrainian governmental uh, investigations bureau has um, started its investigation and is trying to uh, Get, the, get a prosecution over time. If the culprits are being sentenced, they are facing up to 12 years in prison. This in itself shouldn't be too much of a surprise that in a generally corrupt country, there is some problems with corruption. And of course, in times of war and the chaos of war that some will try to enrich themselves isn't something too special. And um, while Russia is known to be one of the most corrupt countries in the world, if you check the Transparency International data, Ukraine is better off, but not that crazy much. Uh, so. Ukraine is known to be a fairly corrupt country and that there is some embezzlement, some corruption in the process of the war shouldn't surprise anyone and shouldn't delegitimize Ukraine's attempt to, to um, preserve its sovereignty either. Let's come to the Eastern Front. Overall, fairly little change along the front line. We have, um, we have the Russians saying they defeated an attack towards uh, Kuzemivka which is down here, here. So an attack towards that direction. Russian military bloggers are saying that the Ukrainians have been over the Sherebets, uh, close to Stelmakivka, which is here. So close to, to, the, uh, to the other attacks. Other than that, the Russian side are talking about lots of Ukrainian offensive activity in the direction of Kremina. Mi Russian military bloggers are saying that the Ukrainians intend to um, to cut the R66, that's the road between Svatove and Kremina. And um, the, uh, there, there are also reports about Russian attacks close to Makivka, Nevske and Bilohorivka. So that's... Oh, yeah, that's here. Bilohorivka, um, Nevske was here and Makivka. So the Russians are attacking here, here, and here. Ukrainians are attacking both in the direction of Kremina as well as north. In total, not much movement of the front line. We have one confirmation of a small Ukrainian advance that's close to Stelmakivka, but that's more or less it, what I found about the last two days. The uh, Ukrainian side is talking about additional, basically countless attacks further south of Bilohorivka. This time, again, they start at Spirne and extend further down to Vuleda, which is here. So uh, more or less along that whole front line, we have Russian attacks. The uh, Ukrainian side are saying, uh, no, the, yeah, around Bakhmut is one of the focus points, which is here. Around uh, Donetsk city is one of the concentrations. The so-called Donetsk People's Republic is claiming that Nevelske has been captured and Ukrainian prisoners were taken. This is here. We, I, I have not seen any visual proof of that yet. The Russians are claiming progress in Marinka, so that supposedly they advanced somewhere here. That seems to be true. And there are heavy, there's heavy fighting south of Vuleda here in Pavlivka, which is still contested. There are still Ukrainian troops in it. That seems to be almost certain. The Ukrainians are saying they destroyed a hotel in Volnov, no, Volnova, 
Volnovka, Volnovka, Volnovaka, Volnovaka, I think, <laughs> here. Uh, in that hotel, Chechen troops had been stationed. Uh, this time the Ukrainians didn't tell us any losses, but as said in the past, if they claim they know how many people they killed 20 kilometers behind the front line, that's probably not too accurate if they give us some numbers there. The, um, the, the concentration of the current fighting is in Soleda, Bakhmut and Donetsk city. According to the deputy defense minister, so Donetsk city around this year, basically around Avdivka, Bakhmut is here and Soledar is here, Bakhmutske Soledar. This is according to the deputy defense minister of Ukraine, Hanna Malia. Um, the attacks at this, in these positions, the Ukrainians are defeating and, and repulsing up to a dozen attacks per day on these positions. So massive activity along the whole front line. And the Russians are gaining a little bit of ground, but not too much movement when it comes to the overall uh, change in territorial control. Along the southern front, we have the usual reports of artillery fire. Also, Shahid-136 and S-300 have been used against, uh, for, um, among others, Mikulayev and Nipo. So Niko Nikopol has been shelled. Nipo has been attacked. Saporizhia, lots of other towns. In this area, the Russians are still attacking far behind the front line as well, as well as close to the front line. The deputy foreign minister of Russia, uh, Andrei Rudenko, has said the Saporizhia nuclear power plant personnel in Nehoda uh, that is essential for the continuation, continued um, use of the power plant has signed with Rosenergoatom, which is the Russian nuclear power agency. The Ukrainian Energoatom is saying, though, that only 100 of the 6,700 people employed, or out of originally 11,000, have signed. Uh, so the rest of the 11,000 have, have apparently fled, only 6,700 remained, and according to the Ukrainians, only 100 of them have signed. The Ukrainian inspector for nuclear regulation is saying the Russians have <clears throat> at one of the seven structures to hold spent fuel rods. They've built a structure which is unknown to what purpose, and it's against the security, the safety regulations. There could be a speculation that is to prepare a false flag dirty bomb attack. Um, spent fuel rods would be a good source for uh, nuclear material that is to be spent later, as it is out of Ukrainian hands. I mean, uh, Saporizhia was under Ukrainian control until February or early March. That could be used in theory if they intended to do a false flag attack with dirty bombs. I don't want to accuse that, but that might be more important at a later point in case such an attack should happen. Um, then we could probably remember this event now. The I, I, e -I -A -O, no, EIAA, or whatever the international atomic energy um, as organization has um, checked ukrainian installations for nuclear nuclear energy three different ones that are under control by the ukrainian government and have they have said they don't see any proof of the ukrainians working on dirty bombs the gur which is the ukrainian military intelligence uh, and again i do this basically every video when i mention the the intelligence agencies or the staffs um, they have an intention to to shape the informational battlefield so we should always take their their messages with a grain of salt but the gur which is the the ukrainian military intelligence they have said chechens have arrived in the saporizhia power plant uh, likely to guard it to protect it from now on and that the russian side has on the roof of reactor 5 installed an installation uh, the, something to do aerial reconnaissance uh, if that is true then that would be a violation of the geneva convention as it would be a clear direct use of the nuclear power plant for military purpose again i mean it would be one of the countless violations before but probably worth still worth mentioning when you come to kherson we have the head of the occupation authority kirill tremusov he said that the Russian troops will likely um, retreat to the other um, side of the river. 
Uh, right now, there is a ton of rumors going on on Twitter. If you look into Twitter, you'll find countless rumors that the Russians are right now retreating. For instance, we have this here, where they said on the on the administration building in Kherson, the, the Russian flag has disappeared. We have this here claiming that in checkpoints all around Kherson, the Russians are suddenly gone. The Russian soldiers are suddenly gone. We have here a video of Ukrainians. I think I still haven't made, I still haven't been able to show you the sound of the computer here, so you can't really see it. This is a video. I shaved and some hair got in nose and throat, so excuse me, please. So this video supposedly shows civilians being excited when they discover that from a checkpoint the Russian soldiers have also disappeared. Obviously without sound this is kind of pointless as you just see them driving by and hear the cheering. Um, we have a lot of, of um, examples here. We have uh, people driving around Kherson city are reporting all roadblocks, soldiers are gone, flags are taken down, defensive positions north of the city are abandoned. Uh, Lots of rumors in this regard. We have um, reports that the Russians are destroying, have destroyed the boats. Um, we see small pleasure craft here that have been destroyed. Uh, that could be judged in a way that basically they want to take away every easy, easy means for the Ukrainian soldiers to follow them over the river. As obviously a small boat like this isn't really a good a military device, but if it's if it's powered by an outboard uh, engine it could still be fast enough to transport i don't know six seven men over the the river in a fairly short time and if you have enough of them you can probably get the majority over the river without too many losses and that's been claimed but at the same time we see something like this here and according to the comments that supposedly was the high mars so that high mars hits that high mars have been used to destroy boats to prevent the russians from fleeing now that could be, it doesn't mean that both can't happen at the same time, that HIMARS have hit some docks, some boats, while the Russians are destroying smaller pleasure craft to, take, to make sure the Ukrainians can't use them. But it might mean that uh, maybe the, the pictures here, those damages might be from HIMARS too in some way, even though we don't really see shrapnel and we don't really see much here. But at the same time, those boats are really haven't been used in months, if not longer so that they might sink a few of them might sink wouldn't be too much of a surprise either anyways so according to all of this we have a lot of rumors as said those are rumors at this very moment i cannot confirm anything i don't i think it is too early to confirm that the russians are actually evacuating it would fit the prior uh message news we had that they started with supply support units, then they then the artillery and air defense followed. So all the units that can be easily hurt with um, can easily be overrun. At the same time, they did fortification works. At the same time, they claimed that they are going to defend it to the end while they were evacuating the civilians, which are kind of war war loot booty for the is it called war, war booty? Like not not the not the um body part but i think loot in in a way um as they would be moved to the ukrainian side is accusing the russians that they deport civilians into the russian federation to assimilate them and basically capture more population this way all of this was happening over the last two or three weeks while the russians were increasingly claiming again no no we are going to fight for it we are going to fight for it in, in the past, on this channel, I said it's one of the most difficult military operations to disengage when your enemy is actively engaging you. Now, to retreat when you are not being attacked is not that complicated. It is, it is well doable with proper planning. But if the enemy is attacking you currently, then disengaging without being overrun is, is extremely challenging. So for the Russian side, if they make the decision to withdraw, it would make perfect sense to claim, to make every possible impression that they are not going to withdraw, to prevent the Ukrainians from pushing them too hard from the front lines to, to prevent the front lines from collapsing and thus being allowing them to withdraw the majority of their troops. 
So we might find out within, let's say, two to three days that this has actually been an evacuation, that this, is actually, this actually means the Russians are giving up Kherson. But I think as of now, I'm a little more cautious. So it's very well within the realm of possibility that this is just some rumors that are, that are spread on the internet, which have no justification vacation on the reality in this regard so we might face the russians still being in Kherson and still fighting and still defending their bridgehead over the dnipro in a week in two weeks maybe even in a month uh, as said this is the current rumor i can't really say much of it so i'll continue with the other information i have i have uh, messages of uh, defensive structures being installed and that's interesting because these days now I actually only read about Ukrainian reports of defensive structures on the left bank of the river, which means the eastern side. Specifically named were the, was the area between Nova Karkov, Karkovka and Korosunka. But also we have the reports of defensive positions being prepared in, in Hola Pristan. There we even have the image, this here, this video here, of, being, of prefabricated pillboxes. So um, prefabricated bunkers, you could say, that are meant for infantry to fight from. Uh, we see them here on, on two trucks being transported. This, this is another point, and we even have reports of Mykhailivka being fortified. This doesn't mean that the Russians expect, this doesn't mean much yet, to be perfectly honest. It doesn't mean that the Russians are giving up the other side of the river. It doesn't mean that they expect to be thrown back towards Mikhailivka. It's o it only means that they know they are on the defensive on this side, on, on the defensive at this part of the front, and that they are preparing for it accordingly. We've seen it in the second Nagorno-Karabakh war in um, 2020, where it was visible on satellite pictures that the Armenians only had one defensive line. They didn't prepare any fallback positions. They had not prepared any defense in depth. So the moment the frontline positions were breached, the Azerbaijani troops had the chance to, to um, fan out on the inside of the Armenian frontline. And the Armenians could only set up ad hoc defenses without pre-prepared positions, despite having 30 years to prepare a defense in depth. The Russians are obviously smarter in this regard, are preparing a better defense here. And in this regard, this doesn't mean they expect Mikhailivka being under threat, under Ukrainian attack within short order. But it makes perfect sense if you have additional capacities that you can use for defensive works that you do it already. Um, in, when it comes to the fighting, we have Russian reports of, uh, of defeated Ukrainian attacks, more or less. They, they say mostly in the direction of Milove and uh, Bereslav. Uh, the attacks seem to mostly happen at Bruskynske and east of it do down to the reservoir. In the, in the south, we have the Russians reporting that they defeated an attack at Seleni High here, which is here. Uh, that was it from the front line here. So, to summarize it real quick, Kherson, some rumors, maybe the Russians are withdrawing, maybe they aren't. We'll have to see within a short time that they go on a serious offensive there, pushing the Ukrainians back seems fairly unlikely at this point. In the south, we have on this in Saporishi along the front line, we have very few reports about active fighting on the ground. Lots of artillery, but not much movement here. And then from Vuleda up to basically Bilohorivka, the Russians are attacking and are here and they are slowly gaining a little bit of ground. Whereas north of it, on the other north of Bilohorivka, on the other side of the Sivyaski Donetsk, the Ukrainians have the clear initiative. They again captured some ground, but this time everything I had reported, everything I had confirmed was that they crossed the Sherebets River and that was it. So they crossed it at a town that was under their control. I'm, as far as I know, they didn't capture Stelmakivka. Uh, they were already at, at um, Stelmakivka, Machivka. But they are still on the advance. The Russians are still saying that there's no chance of them doing a serious counteroffensive at the very least until early, uh, late November, early December. So the Ukrainians have the, the initiative more or less here to the border. That Russian in initiative here is more or less stalemate, not, not much going on. And here we have Ukrainian initiative. Um, there's some reports about, let's call it partisan activity. It's mixed with some sabotage. 
The Russians are saying they they are, the Ukrainians are saying they arrested a Ukrainian policeman in Odessa, and that Ukrainian policeman was working for the Russian intelligence agencies. He had collected information about military movements and was planning to blow up a railroad line. The deputy uh, mayor. The Russian deputy mayor, so the deputy occupation mayor of Berislav, had has been attacked by a IED, with an IED, and he's heavily injured. And the head of the occupation government in in the, on the Crimea is saying the FSB has prevented a terrorist attack, as they call it, on a power plant. The Russian media is saying it was a Ukrainian from the SBU, so from the Ukrainian intelligence agency. When we come to the mobilization, we have the head of the main organization and mobilization directorate of the Russian general staff, Yevgeny Burdinsky. He said that this time seven and a half fewer recruits have been um, drafted. We're talking about the biannual draft that was supposed to happen on October the 1st. This is now November the 1st. And he was saying the recruits will this will not be used in and not be stationed in Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson this year. So he's obviously addressing the fears by the Russian parents that their soldiers might be used in, let's imagine, air quotation marks inside of Russia, inside of the freshly occupied provinces. He's saying they are not going to be used, they are not going to enter fighting and they are not going to be used there this year. But he said this year. So next year might be a different story and according to analysis the Russians will probably be strong enough to more or less stabilize the front line with the freshly mobilized soldiers over the winter. But in March when the recruits are fully trained to the degree that the Russians usually train their soldiers before they send them into their units uh, then they that that would be next year march to may somewhere and at that point they would have to be sent to their units where and those units in the majority are in ukraine so at that point we can expect the the regular draftees to appear along the front line as well uh, there are numerous russian media reports that in the whole country the mobilization is still continuing people are still being handed draft papers or papers to to um, mobilize them the central military district supposedly said journalists that the mobilization is continuing until Putin is signing a decree that it was ended. And a member of the defense committee of the Duma, Viktor Sobolev, said, me, uh, said um, in, in talks with the media that a general mobilization is well within the realm of possibility if the situation is worsening. Novaya Gazeta, the opposition newspaper, I think they are now in exile. They said that at least 23 mobilized um, soldiers were killed already through violence of their comrades with uh, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, suicide, and with, with accidents. Uh, in addition to the confirmed mobilized men that have already fallen. In Donetsk, there are reports that a camp is being reopened that was used in the past to house mutiny uh, Russian soldiers that were mutiny that didn't want to fight. They were housing them under horrible conditions to basically force them to enter the fight. The, the report of, about this is coming from a Russian opposition media, so it might not be wrong, right, it might be wrong, we don't know. But they are saying the mobilized men are being forced to either fight, otherwise they would be given to Wagner to be used in the Wagner units. And if that is true, it would mean that they would be threatened with being executed, as we know from Wagner that they basically tell their fighters, if you don't charge the front line when we tell you, we're going to execute you. Um, but this time it wouldn't be criminals, this time it would be mobilized men and that it would kind of make sense that they try to tell them if you are not joining your regular units and doing the duty we give you, you follow the orders we give you, we're giving you to Wagner which will expend you and if you don't want to, still don't want to fight they will just give you a shot in the neck. Um, this would kind of make sense. Ukrainian authorities are saying uh, the, the Ukrainian legitimate authorities for Militopol and Mariupol are saying that the Russian occupation authorities are forcing inhabitants of both to enter volunteer battalions and territorial defense units. And from Ulyanov, we have a. Um, from Ulyanov and Shru. 
Ovashia. We have reports about protests. We have an image here. I'm not sure. Yeah, here it's Ulyanov. Uh, Russian soldiers are complaining about uh, that they ha aren't being paid, um, that they ha have not been that have not received the the signing bonus that they were offered etc so they haven't received the money they're getting this is obviously showing significant problems because if they those differences are not made up by the central government if they don't make sure everyone is getting paid then the soldiers will receive different payments for the same job which must harm the morale of the soldiers on the front line even further if they know that they are basically being kept on starving rations and the guys 50 meters down the trench are being pay paid wealthy wages um, also this is showing that we are not talking i mean this isn't some civilians demonstrating here these are soldiers which are basically in mutiny which is a horrible sign for the discipline within an army that something like this is actually happening kadyrov has now said that he's going to um, draft further chechens with combat experience but he said he's going to use them among Chechens, so likely with the Kadyrovtsi, so his personal military. They are not going to be sent to the Russian military, that seems likely. And he also emphasized that his men, his, that the families of the men he's going to call up are going to um, know where their men are being used. That the, this, this emphasizing, emphasizing this, this part is likely an, a further attack of, on the russian ministry of defense where there has been a lot of of um pro, a lot of uh, problems and the families of of people that were called up were complaining a lot that they don't even know where their husbands fathers brothers etc sons where they are right now and uh, kadyrov is showing here apparently that he's going to do it better which can be understood within the the current uh, power struggle within russia that is being mentioned here in the situation reports over the last few weeks uh, the if the uh, as the mobilization seems to continue while the mobilization seems to continue but this time more or less in secret they are no longer doing it officially the government is claiming it's more or less over even though there are still being people called up we now have reports that the, there are they, in Russia now there are renewed attempts to create volunteer units to find additional men to fight along the front line. But then again, uh, there would be the justification now to ask why would why would there be any serious volunteers showing up now that haven't volunteered in an earlier phase where victory seems seem much more likely after the draft after the the call up of reserves it seems highly unlikely that any attempts to generate additional force with volunteer battalions now is going to succeed to a certain to a significant degree that seems more more than unlikely in Kherson, we also have the news that uh, the russians are creating a territorial defense battalion with over 1000 men from ukrainian citizens when it comes to the political uh, sphere we have more information about that the continued deportation or evacuation of ukrainians as said which side you want to uh, follow more if you see the world more pro-russian then, then it's probably evacuations the russian the ukrainians themselves say it's deportations that those from kherson are continuing now they want to deport or evacuate 70,000 civilians from the eastern bank of the Dnipro, so from this side here. And they are being given financial aid to find housing in on the Crimea in Krasnodar, Rostov and Voronezh. All of this shows that it's unlikely that they are going to return fast. So this is at the very least looks like a resettlement program. Obviously, then it comes to the discussion whether it can be called deportation or just evacuation. It comes a little bit to the political sphere, but we have one news from the Ukrainian general staff here. Again, take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. But according to them in Veluka Lepechuka, Lepetushka, Lepetusha, Ucha, I think like this, Veluka Lepetusha, here so it's not even close to Kherson and it's even on the other side of the 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 Dnipro reservoir here the Russians are evacuating people or deporting them and 
According to the Ukrainian general staff, the civilians are not allowed to take their private cars. They have to enter buses that are being handed over to them. And that would indicate that the Russians want to make sure those people go where they actually want them to be, which would be an, a strong indication that this is not an evacuation but a deportation, as they want to control the Russian population, uh, the Ukrainian, I'm sorry, the Ukrainian population, they want to make sure they are not venturing off. They want to make sure they are getting away from there where exactly the Russians want them. And that is not within within Kherson Oblast. That's at the very least on Crimea, if not in Russia itself. All of this would indicate clear uh, goal of deportation. The U Ukraine, Ukraine again, Ukrainian government is saying that by now 10,000 children have been deported to Russia and they are saying that those 10,000 are meant to be adopted by Russian parents, which would mean they should be turned into Russians and that would qualify as a genocide as it would, try, it, it, as it would be considered an attempt to basically Russify a whole generation of Ukrainian citizens. And on on Twitter, we have rumors now appearing, which is kind of funny. Uh, I cannot say much. I've heard about this guy a couple of times. As you can see, I don't follow him because I was not too convinced about what I, he wrote so far. And I didn't get the impression that a lot of his information is too accurate. But according to him, uh, the more or less this threat is more or less saying that, that Prigozhin is preparing for a military coup, that he was getting his his best mercenaries back to Russia and doing polygraph tests to make sure they're not lying to find out whether more or less whether they'd be willing to fight within Russia in Moscow to fight for the which is which he at least interprets for an attempt to take over the military, the FSB and the Kremlin. Um, whether that is actually true, I have my doubts. Um, because if he believes it, then Prigozhin would already fall out. And if this is actually true and a guy outside of Russia and Ukraine finds out and publicizes it, then we should have known by now that Prigozhin has fallen out of a window. We don't have anything anything in this regard. We have, don't have any news in this regard. So I would call BS at this regard, but we might find out more in some future point. Uh, Finally, we have news the GUR says, the Ukrainian military intelligence is saying Iran is delivering an additional 200, I think it was 300, 300 Shahid 136 Mohajer 6 and Arash 2 drones. They are going to be, de be delivered in parts and being put together, constructed within Russia and being, ha being thus getting uh, Russian signature, Russian uh, prints on it, etc., to make the impression that it's Russian drones and not Iranian ones. And the speaker of the U.S. National Security Council, John Kirby, has said that American intelligence agencies believe North Korea is supporting Russia with artillery grenades. Not that much of a surprise either, especially as we've heard about supposedly negotiations with Russia between Russia and North Korea about the sale of artillery ammunition a month ago at the very least, so some time ago. And finally, the last thing I have is this year a video of Asov fighters with, um, with drones and guns against drones, and which shows that they are having, they're getting equipment to, to take down civilian drones. And we should mention what we can see here and what was, wait, let me take, turn off my picture for a moment. What you can see here, that is the Black Sun. The Black Sun is a neo-nazi symbol a nazi symbol uh, it's basically a swastika with a, with a lot of additional arms it's usually clearly used by neo-nazis as a less obvious swastika whether this is a hardcore nazi or not i cannot judge i can just say one thing without trying to defend him i live in central america and when i moved here i met a uh, uh, a Colombian woman t who told me her sister is like Hitler. And uh, when I was a little surprised, she told me she means like uh, she's she wants to make decisions. She's uh, she's uh, hard headed. She wants to to go straight forward, like a lot of a lot of secondary character traits you would 
that you would not really uh, combine with Hitler, but apparently in in her family or in her culture, in her in her circle, Hitler is not seen as the war criminal, as the uh, the criminal he was, but as somebody who made decisions, who was uh, going forward, following his goals or something like this. Uh, this is not to to justify anything that is going on by Asov. To me, it is completely irrelevant in this war whether or not. Asov are hardcore Nazis or not. In my mind, it's only important whether they commit crimes and if those crimes are encouraged or prosecuted by the Ukrainian government. Anything else is something for after the war, in my personal opinion. So they can be Nazis, they might not be Nazis. I don't want to hide an image like this from you, the viewers. I want to show you that we see a black sun here. I want to say it's quite possible that this is a hardcore Nazi that is presenting himself here. It might though be that it is seen in some other cultural context, which should not be a surprise to anyone who has moved around in the world a little, that things that are outrageous to one culture are far less delicate to another culture. In this regard, as said, I cannot judge. I do not want to judge. You can call him the, the Asov uh, regiment, hardcore Nazis, I leave this to you. It's not my mission, not my goal to convert you in any direction here. So I just wanted to show you this image, both of the equipment they are receiving and both uh, try not to hide something that might be this, uh, not, not that positive for the Ukrainian side. I don't intend to hide it from my viewers like you. And there we come to an end. To the end, this channel is only possible because of the support from viewers like you. I want to thank, I want to express my heartfelt thanks to everyone already supporting the channel. If you also want to support the channel and allow me to continue this, then you'll find the, the options in the description. Thank you very much to everyone already supporting and you can also support the channel, the channel by hitting the like button, by leaving comments. What do you think about the Asov Battalion, Asov Regiment? Do you think it actually matters how they think as long as they don't have a political influence and as long as they are not encouraged to do crimes and if they commit crimes they are, they are being prosecuted? What do you think about this? Is this of any relevance in the context of the war? I'm interested to read your comments and obviously uh, heated discussion in this regard is good for the the growth of the channel and the algorithm as well and growth of the channel obviously i want to invite everyone who has not subscribed yet to subscribe to the channel don't forget the bell icon so you don't miss future videos and if you like the channel please recommend it to your friends and acquaintances so it can grow further that's it for me for now thank you for watching and i'll be back